Mark Tremonti, welcome to Life in Six Strings. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, thanks for coming on. Um, I don't know where to start really, because you've been extremely busy. Um, it feels like you've made the most of everything that's gone on the last few years. But the thing that was most surprising about anything you've done is the new record, Tremonti Sings Sinatra. Um, you put your guitar down for this one. And if I was listening to that record, and I didn't know it was you, I would never have thought it was you. Because it just your voice just sounds completely different to anything that you do with Tremonti. And so yeah, it it's extraordinary. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That that was kind of the the um the idea behind it was to do something completely different so I could start this uh take a chance for charity organization to raise money for charities and uh challenge other people to do something that people wouldn't see coming as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the the whole idea of the charity is fantastic. But then, of course, the charity that you've chosen is one that's particularly close to your heart. Um, tell us about that charity. Yeah, NDSS is the National Down Syndrome Society, and it's uh, the biggest um, organization in the country for for folks to help out folks with Down syndrome. And it was all inspired by uh, by my girl here. You know, so that's that's my baby girl. But um, so I was, you know, I was very, very into Frank Sinatra and singing like Frank Sinatra, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And then once we got the diagnosis that our daughter had Down syndrome, I was like, you know what, I'm going to record a record. And I'm going to do it for charity. And Frank Sinatra raised over a billion dollars for charity. So it's perfect to carry on his legacy and, and let people know that he was such a huge philanthropist. Wow. Okay. That's incredible. And of course, yeah, all the proceeds for this record are going to um, the Down Syndrome charity that you've chosen, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, so I sort of know why you've chosen Sinatra. I mean, obviously you're a fan, but there is anyone that you could have chosen out there. So, so why did you decide to go for him? Um, you know, I just, uh, I had one of those moments where I was just obsessed. You know, I just, um, over the years, I've always been a fan. And during Christmas, I'll get on the mic and sing some karaoke Christmas songs and sing like Frank Sinatra. And I just, uh, I think one night it was like this, the switch went off. I just needed to, just like on the guitar where you hear another player and you want to play just like him. Um, I heard Sinatra sing and I'm like, I, I got to do this. Um, and I dove in for years before I knew I was going to do an album. I was just doing it for fun. Okay, so when you approached it then, did you kind of have an idea of the songs that you knew you wanted to do? Were there some, some that maybe didn't work that you wanted to do? Um, I know I wanted to do uh, a handful of the ones that are on the record, but for the most part, I, I dove deep into his catalog and, and listened to, he, you know, he's recorded over 1400 songs. So it's, and on top of that, he had TV shows where he'd perform all night long. So he has if you're a Sinatra fan, you'll never run out of new material. Um, you'll always discover new stuff. So I just listened to as much as I could. Every time I'd go to sleep, I'd put the headphones on, listen to a new album, listen to a new era, um, listen to a new compilation of his TV performances and find all the, the things that suited my voice the best and that got me the most inspired. Okay, so do you reckon there'll be an album number two then where you can go delving a bit more into the, the catalog? I hope there's album number 10. This, there's so much you can do with Sinatra. You know, I would love to do this for years. And so obviously you came, you know, the, the charity and then you decided to choose Sinatra. How did you make it happen? Because you've got some, firstly, you've got the seal of approval from the Sinatra estate, which is pretty impressive. And then on top of that, you managed to get some of um, the musicians that played with Sinatra as well. So tell us how that came about. Yeah, so I told my manager, I want to do this this project. And he said, you know, my teacher growing up was Dan McIntyre, who was Frank Sinatra's touring guitar player. <laughs> so it's just it was just one of those times when the stars aligned. So he set up a lunch with Dan McIntyre and, um, and Mike Smith, who was Frank Sinatra's band leader. He played with Sinatra for 40 years. Yeah. So they, they went to lunch and they said, all right, can your boy sing? And my manager just believing in me, never hearing me singing a note of Sinatra goes, yeah, of course he can. <laughs> so they didn't you know nobody had heard a note before we got into the studio so luck be a lady was the first song we uh practiced mike smith organized 17 musicians for the first session uh 15 of which were um in frank sinatra's touring band and it was the coolest thing i've ever done in the studio to be honest with you i didn't know that tim had lessons from um from him that's incredible he never told me that Oh yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he grew up with, he said he was a tough guy, you know, and he, he really prepped me for this. He's like, these guys are hardcore. These guys are, you got to know your stuff uh, when you're working with them. So when I went in there, I was so prepared. I was so uber prepared that I, you know, I couldn't have spent another minute learning any more about it. I was ready to go. And I heard they, they even like to the point where they were giving you the tea that Frank Sinatra, like the, the concoction that he had. What is it? Spill the beans. I have it, I have it right here. So here's my, here's my Sinatra workbook, you know, and you, you see the color. It's all blue eyes. Um, so, so Mike Smith came in before I sang and he gave me this. Um, oh my God. So he said, I wrote Frank's on there, <laughs> but that's the tea he used. And he said, here's the right amount of, of lemon. Here you go. This is what he would, he would use. And when my voice got hoarse at the end, uh, he's like, do you smoke cigarettes? I go, no, I used to when I was a kid, but uh, he's like, well, the old man, if he, his voice was hurting him, he'd go smoke a cigarette and then come back and sing again. <laughs> like, well, I don't think smoking a cigarette is going to help me. So some of these, some of these old school musicians have different ways of looking at things. <laughs> Yeah, I've never heard that. Go out and drink and smoke some more and then come back. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's excellent. I love it. But they must have had some incredible stories about Frank. Oh, yeah. You, you know, these guys haven't been together for some of them for 30 years. So, you know, when you this was had to have been the highlight of their lives when they were touring with Frank Sinatra. So when you ask them about it, uh, they just gush about it. You know, they just keep t t telling you all these great stories and uh, hearing it from from them personally it's to me i would have done anything to see frank sinatra live uh, much less go and play with them so to hear these stories for me is the most exciting thing in the world because i've like i said i've i've read all the books but until you hear it from somebody in person um you really can go deep into the stories yeah oh my god i can imagine so do you reckon there'll be a christmas album then you can give michael buble a run for his money now you know what <laughs> Since, since this album's come out, I've heard that a lot. So um, I'm looking for any excuse to get back in the studio with these guys. So I would love to do a Christmas record. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be, I'd be thrilled. Oh my God. Can you imagine? That would be excellent. Do you mm -hmm. think you could ever try and do a metal take on it? No, you know, I want to stay completely respectful to the legacy yeah. and do it. You know, when I recorded this record, I told the producer, I want it to sound like the old Capitol Records recordings. I want it to be... Want, I don't want it to be overproduced or polished. I want it to be sound just like it just happened that moment. And when you hear the record, the, that is the band one take from start to finish. There's no cutting and pasting. There's no, there's no tweaking anything. It's just, um, you know, it was mixed with some levels. But other than that, it wasn't, it wasn't polished. That's, that's the way it sounded. These guys sound. Oh, wow. That just goes to show, doesn't it, the skill that they had back then, the musicianship. Yeah, absolutely insane so you know it is part of this take a chance on for charity is mm -hmm. there any other musicians that you're going to try and convince to do it maybe miles get him to go out of the genre yeah I'll, i've talked to miles about doing it um, but i've also i'm trying to kind of reach outside of the box i don't want to just go to my friends first i want i mean my 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 yeah. rock and roll friends so i reached out to uh well actually larry the cable guy's a buddy of mine and he he texted me about how much he loved the project. And I had done a record with him yeah. years ago, a comedy record that went platinum. And I, I said, all right, I, I would love to um, ask you to participate, you know, because I, I did the record with you back in the day. I'd love for you to do something. So he's going to record a song or two or three, whatever he wants to do. Um, Lone Star, the country band reached out. They want to do something. Steve Stevens, Chris Daughtry, um, Blackstone Cherry talked about wanting to do something. Fuel um uh the edge the wrestler um so we're trying to get as many different uh diversified folks as we can to get this thing launched so i want it to be like the ice bucket challenge if you do it i want you to challenge somebody else to do it and i challenge you to do it <laughs> you have a you've got a platform it's perfect for you get do, do something that people wouldn't expect you to do and then I challenge somebody else to do the same thing oh my god now there's a thought well i feel like this is my challenge i feel like there you I'm go. outside the box already <laughs> Do it, do it. I'd love to see your challenge. Yeah, and I've done it so publicly. I've literally been embarrassing myself for like the last 18 months. So, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. 
No, it'd be cool. Yeah, I think I think it's a wonderful idea actually to 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 you know get people to push themselves, challenge themselves, and it, it's something that you do a lot. I think if you think about everything that you've done, like the stuff that you've done with Creed, um, Alter Bridge, this, you've you know you've written a book. Um, if you like pinball, play guitar. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and then there's the art side of it as well. Um, I mean, what? Are you one of those people that has to kind of like constantly be doing stuff to, you know, what, like you, you, I don't know where the energy comes from. And you're a dad as well. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I just love being, being creative and seeing, you know, if I see somebody that, that does something I think is, is um, inspiring, I, I want to follow in their footsteps and try to do my best to, to do something like that. So I'm a, I'm a huge, I'm an avid reader. So I, um, I'm a big, you know, I could be, meet big rock band people and be like completely at, at ease meeting them. But when I meet an author, I'm more in awe, you know, cause it's these guys, their imaginations are incredible. So I said, you know, I want to, one of my bucket list things was to write a novel. So I tried to tackle that best I could. And then, um, you know, you see painters and I want to, I want to learn how to paint. I see, you know, I love to take something that doesn't exist and you, you, take your imagination and you you bring it to the world and it means a lot to people like music yeah i think music is one of the most magical things in the world it doesn't uh it's this um intangible thing that means so much to people and what did you do most of during lockdown because i can imagine the painting thing was probably quite a good thing to do when 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 we were all going nuts yeah oh yeah you know i spent a month in my daughter's nursery painting a mural in her room which which is this yeah. huge you know 15 foot tall thing um I moved in, okay. in during COVID, so I actually painted my house, you know, which is a different kind of painting, but it's therapeutic. I, you know, it was, it was fun just being outside and getting something done. I recorded a Termani album yeah, um, and wrote for this Alter Bridge record, did the Sinatra thing, uh, and had a daughter. So it was a very busy time. That's what I mean. You don't sit still, do you? You're crazy. It's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm nuts, I guess. You are. Um, so the Alter Bridge, what's happening with, with, the, with the record? Are you working on it at the moment? So um, drums are done, guitars are done. I, I started tracking my guitars yesterday and Miles and I kind of take the day, I'll take the day shift and he'll take the night shift. Oh, really? That's mm -hmm. how you do it. And where are you recording it? Is it at your house? Then you've got a studio there or? Um, my, my producer Elvis Basquette's studio is only about 10 minutes from my house. So he, he moved here from Virginia because he's been doing so much work with us and loves Orlando. So he moved here, so it worked out for us. Oh, that's great. That's brilliant. Yeah. And then you've just announced that you, your tour as well, which you're doing with um, House Storm and uh, Mammoth. Are you excited about that? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're really excited to get back on the road because we missed so much of an opportunity to tour with Walk the Sky. Um, you know, we've, we've been dying to get back out there. So we're really excited about this new record and a lot of the songs are going to be a, a lot of fun to play live. So we can't wait. Yeah. And the great thing is everyone's been listening to the record for a long, you know, a, a certain amount of time now. So mm -hmm. they'll know all the songs and, and, you know, in a way, I think that's great. Well, we'll be, you know, we'll be featuring the new record now. So we'll have a whole yes. batch of new songs that people aren't familiar with that we can't wait to play. That's uh, true. That is true. <laughs> oh my God, where has that time gone? And um, so, what's happening with the novel then? Because I know that you um, wrote a book that accompanied Dying Machine. Um, mm -hmm. But are you writing a new one? I hear. What's what's the deal? What's going on there? Uh, well, there was interest from one of the there's the big five publishing houses here that um, one uh, one of them was interested in doing a publishing deal for me and doing a multi book deal. So he's you know I had a meeting and they asked me if this was a, uh, a one-off or if I wanted to do this, um, you know, more often throughout the rest of my life. And I said, I absolutely want to keep doing this. So they asked me to turn in another um, synopsis of another story. So I did, and they loved it. And they said, all right, now we want you to rewrite the first five chapters of a dying machine and make it a little more, um, they, you know, I, I wrote the di a dying machine book to be more of like a human emotional story and they wanted it to be more of like an action film kind of a thing. They're like, I wanted to read like the book. So I uh, took the story and started at a different point. So it's kind of high action now um, and just finished the first five chapters and put it and now I'm putting together a, an outline for the whole book. And um, 
a re-outline. So I had to reimagine the story and um, I'm supposed to get on the phone with them within the next couple of weeks to see if it, if they approved it and I'll hopefully get a publishing deal. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So it will be like a, a follow-up to Dying Machine then in a way, will it? Or No, it's going to be the same world, but it's going to, it's going to be, um, it's just, it's like your favorite story thought by another imagination kind of a thing. It's just a different, it's almost like a choose your own adventure where it's com completely gone a different route. Same characters, same background, just uh, much, much more action, I would think, you know, different, di different plot with the same characters. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that does. And did you and because you worked with what was his name? John, John Shirley, wasn't it on the yes, on the first one. So did you haven't teamed up with him on this of you? Is it just you on your own? This no, time? it's me and, and Chris, Chris Narosny is um, he's worked with James Patterson. And um, he's done three novels with him. So he's, he's great. And we get along. Awesome. We get on the phone for hours and just talk. All right, what's the next? What's going to happen now? And it's so much fun. Just you know sharing your imagination with somebody and, and uh yeah. you know having them help polish your story have you got a title for it yet it's just going to be a dying machine oh it is okay yeah right. yeah brilliant and i guess the great thing about writing a book well i always find when i'm writing and stuff is that you can kind of do it anywhere like for me it's like you can stay in your pajamas all day and do it if you want yeah like you, you could just be on the road and you know on the bus and you can just like write a few chapters or you know yeah Absolutely. You can, it's just like re reading a book. You can do it wherever you want. Yeah. It's like practicing singing. You know, you, you don't have to have your guitar with you. You can do it whenever you want. I know that's the thing. See, I moved all my guitars up here and I used to have one in every room before. And I found that was really helpful at keeping me mm -hmm. practicing because I'd just pick it up, you know, just be sitting there and pick it up and do a bit here and then go downstairs oh, and yeah. up there. But yeah, since they've all come up here, I've noticed that my, I don't practice as much. Yeah, you should put one next to your couch where you watch TV or whatever, yes. you know, so you're you're never just sitting there watching TV. You're always plucking away. Yeah, I know. I know. So how old were you when you started playing? Uh, I was 11, 11 or 12. That's the uh, that's the sweet spot, isn't it? That's what most most of the greats start around that age. I think the great greats start earlier i think a lot of a lot of the people that are just untouchable like the joe bonamassas and the and the guthrie govans and all these guys are like five when they start playing you know they have parents who own guitars and are musicians yeah. who teach them at a young age and those Derek trucks you know oh. who's ever going to be as good as Derek trucks you know it's uh these these they're untouchable guitar players 